Now let's continue with the NICE theme with a look at its latest guidance on the diagnosis and management of prostate cancer, published earlier this month. The striking change for us here at Inside Health was the inclusion of MRI scans. Put simply, the updated guidance confirms the role of MRI in helping doctors decide how to investigate suspected cancers. Not all will need treatment, but sorting the aggressive cancers that do from the slow-growing variety that do not can be difficult. So how do MRI scans improve on current tests? Well, to find out, I went along to University College Hospital to meet consultant urologist Professor Mark Emberton. It's really quite shocking how bad our tests are. We've had a finger which isn't particularly sensitive at detecting... To feel the gland. Exactly yeah. right. Then PSA came along about 20 years, and that does identify people at increased risk of prostate cancer. This is, this is the blood test, yeah. Correct. And then to actually identify prostate cancer, we put needles into the prostate, and that's a process that is random. So it's the only cancer in which we do that. All other cancers, and if you have a biopsy for a breast cancer, for instance, you either have a lump or the mammography, the scan that tells you where to put the needle. Same goes for liver, kidney. There's no other cancer in which we blindly put needles into the prostate. So increasingly, we're finding out that our needles never really went to the right place. And there are parts of the prostate, the apex, which is the bow of the ship, the middle bit, and the bit that's furthest away from the rectum never get sampled. So quite often, we tell men they're all clear when, in fact, they're not. So this might be a man who's got a raised PSA test, um, goes in, has a biopsy, and we can't find anything. Exactly. And it's a, it's a nice consultation because the patient's delighted, but the urologist deep down knows that the certainty of that reassurance is to be guarded. And there, a recent trial published this month looked at patients that had two negative biopsies and then had a very, very detailed biopsy. So these are men that were told twice that they were clear. 58% of them were found to have clinically significant disease when they had this very special biopsy. More than half. That, absolutely, that we call prostate mapping. So what the NICE guidance is suggesting now is that if you have a negative biopsy, that the next stage, you, rather than be reassured and said so you can go, everything's fine, the next stage will be an MRI scan. Correct. And perhaps another biopsy. Correct. So this is the first time that MRI scans have featured in the NICE guidance. What's their role? Uh, it does two things. It tells us where a tumour is within the prostate, so will allow us to guide our needles to it, and therefore if the patient tests negative, we can have greater reassurance. It also allows our needle to get a, a bullseye, if you like, and so that the information that we convey to patients is more representative. In the past, if we missed it, we didn't know, and if we got a glancing blow, we didn't know. Professor Emberton works closely with consultant radiologist Dr Claire Allen, whose job it is to interpret the MRI results, and that can be tricky. Everybody's prostate is different, and they're like fingerprints. And that's where the real technique of identifying tumour and skill, hopefully, comes in because everybody's prostate is different. Because your job is to differentiate between what's normal and what's um, abnormal. And that's and it's relatively straightforward if you're looking at a structure that should look the same in everybody. But in the prostate, they all look completely different. This is a patient who is in his 70s. And in young men, you only have this outer casing. If you consider a cauliflower, and this outer bit, which we call the peripheral zones, is like the green leaf of the cauliflower, and that is the bit that you have and that you're born with mm -hmm. and that younger men, you'll only see that bit of the prostate. This whole central area here is called the transition zone and that's the bit that grows throughout a man's life and that will grow to a different extent in different men. We used to think with tumours that the majority of tumours used to only occur in this part, the outer sort of the green leaf bit of the prostate but we now are increasingly aware that there are more and more tumours found in this central transition zone and the reason for that is that we never used to biopsy this bit and it was systematically an area of the prostate that got missed when men were biopsied and it's the ability to use these new techniques which really have only been available for maybe the last five to six years that has really pushed on our ability to identify prostate tumours. Can you show me one where there is something that you're concerned about? So you recognise what we were just looking at as a normal prostate and you can see in this particular patient, he's got a different sized gland. It's overall a little bit smaller and you can see his prostate here. You can see the outer wrapping, if you like, that is still quite uniformly white. 
but you can also appreciate that coming out of the upper surface of the prostate is a big irregular mass which was not present on the previous scan. You can also see that it looks black on the scan and this is tumour and this is a very typical appearance of tumour. This is the sort of tumour that maybe 10 years ago we would never have found because you can't feel it when a doctor puts a finger into the back passage. This tumour would not be palpable. Because it's at the front of the gland. Because it's at the front of the gland. And also, if you put a biopsy through the back passage, it is well away from the biopsy mm. tract. So these are the sort of tumours which we never found. OK, I'm sitting here as a pragmatist and I'm thinking, why aren't you doing the MRI scan first and then the biopsy? Great question. That is my own disappointment, but I think there may be good reasons why. So it, I do it. If I was having a biopsy, I would ask for an MRI beforehand on a straw poll of urologists in a recent conference. All the urologists said they'd, pro they'd do it. And I think to derive location, it's, you have to do an MRI beforehand. Mm. If you're going to do a targeted biopsy, you need to do your MRI before. The other things that MRI do, which, which is reassure men that they don't need a biopsy. So, in other words, if a woman has a mammogram and it's negative, mm. she doesn't have a biopsy. Mm. If you have a CT scan of the kidney and it's normal, you don't have a biopsy. That is the subject of a very important trial, which is currently recruiting. So, if I were to have a PSA of 6, which is abnormal, an MRI which is deemed to be normal by a very good radiologist, uh, how sure can I be that I am free of clinically significant disease? And that's being evaluated currently in a trial called PROMISE. And the beauty about that trial is that it's opening out throughout the country so that if men today are offered a biopsy or feel they need one, they can access that trial and get a very high quality MRI and a verification biopsy in the same sitting. MRI obviously has a role in getting the diagnosis correct in the first place. But what about in this other area that's very important too, is looking at what to do with somebody once you've diagnosed them? A lot of people listening will think, I've got a prostate cancer, I don't really care whether it's a quiet one or an aggressive one, I just want it out. Please treat me so I don't have to worry about it. What's the downside of, of over-treatment? So you've mentioned over-treatment, which is a very interesting concept, but a difficult one to grasp. It's the consequence of over-diagnosis. And so this is about treating people who, if left untreated, would suffer no reduction in quality of life or quantity of life. And if you catch a cancer very, very early, it's a bit like doing a weather report a month in advance. You can't really predict very much. And so many cancers are just not destined to progress in that way, particularly the, the prostate. So probably the biggest error we commit today is to treat people unnecessarily. The downsides that uh, bother patients are really uh, aspects of their genitourinary function. This is about their ability to get and maintain erections, their ability to ejaculate, and also their ability to pass urine normally. And incontinence, particularly when they cough or sneeze. With radiotherapy, the issue of incontinence is less, but there is effects on the rectum and also the bladder that can lead to sometimes fecal incontinence and sometimes an overactive or a small bladder. The other error we make is under-diagnosis and under-treatment. And these are men that are told they're all clear when in fact they're not. And just the other day in clinic, I saw a man who'd had five previous biopsies, all negative, and the PSA was rising over the preceding six to eight years. He was probably curable, you know, six to eight years ago. He was definitely incurable when I showed him his large tumour in the anterior part of the prostate. Professor Mark Emberton, and you'll find more details on the promised trial that he mentioned on our website. Go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4 and click on I for Inside Health. And if you're Googling it, there's no E on the end of promise.